chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to her. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and he held. The bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. Okay, stop right there. Okay, so we see Moses. He's a, a priest of Midian. I mean, his, his father-in-law was a priest of Midian. Now, Midian was like a a region uh, approximately pro approximately like 200 miles from the borders of Egypt. Um, so here's Moses. Moses got kicked out of Egypt. He got exiled from Egypt because he killed an Egyptian that was, that was uh, tormenting a... Hello. He killed an Egyptian that was, uh, you know, abusing uh, uh, one of the children of Israel. So here's Moses. Uh, at this point, Moses is about 80 years old. When he got exiled from Egypt, he was about 40, and he spent 40 years in the wilderness tending the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, and so here's Moses at the foot of this mountain that they call the Mountain of God. And the reason why they call it the Mountain of God is because all of the people that lived in that area believed that, that God resided on top of this mountain. Uh, and I'm sure if you've ever uh, been in the woods or been in a, in a rural area, there's always folk tales about different things. So I'm sure that every time lightning flashed on the mountain, people thought, say, okay, God must be upset or God is up there. So uh, Moses is at the foot of this uh, mountain uh, uh, called the mountain of God, uh, Mount Horeb. So then in verse 2 it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Now, one of the things I want you to focus on in verse 2 is the title and the angel of the Lord. Now, whenever you read the Old Testament and you see that, that, that word, that term used, the angel of the Lord, that's called a Christophany or a theophany. And what that is, is it's a bodily appearance of God. All right, it's a bodily appearance of God. Remember the story about the three Hebrew boys when they were in the fiery furnace? They looked in and the king said, I threw three in. We put three in there and I see four. And one of them looks like the son of God. So you, you'll find in, in the Old Testament there, there are appearances of God. Another uh, example of that was when Samson's parents received the news that their, their child was going to be a Nazarite and they, had a, they were going to have a special child. That was an example when the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's parents. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua, you know, but he looked like a soldier. These are called Christophanies or uh, Theophanies, meaning, it, to put it bluntly, that was a, a pre-New Testament appearance of Jesus. So, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, is Jesus found out throughout the whole Bible? Yes, he is. Let me take it back a step further. If you go back to Genesis, Genesis 3, uh, 17, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He's used the plural word, let man, let's make man in our image. And that word uh, to describe God back then is Elohim. And Elohim was a plural name for God. So a lot of times when you talk to people, Jews, Jehovah Witnesses, Muslims, and they try to tell you that there's no such thing as a trinity, there's at least five examples in the Old Testament where God spoke plural. You know, I'll give you another example. In, when the Tower of Babel was being built, God said, let us go down and confound their language. All right? So God spoke in plural. Why did he speak in plural? Because God is three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Jehovah Witnesses believe Jesus was created, but that's not true. He always existed. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So uh, what Moses was seeing here was actually seeing Jesus. Okay? So, but let's look at this again. Okay, it says that, the, uh, that Mount Horeb or Sinai, the mountain of God, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, a bush burned with fire, yet was not consumed. So look at the, let's break this down. It says that this flame of fire uh, 
was out of the midst of the bush, meaning the fire was, was in the middle of the bush. Now, the reason why it caught his attention was because in the desert, there's always brush fires. Sometimes it gets so hot in the desert, dry stuff just catches fire. That's how hot it can get in the desert. So to see a bush burning in the desert wasn't strange. But to see a bush burning and not consumed, basically, you're looking at a bush that's burning, but all the leaves are still on it. All right? It's still intact. And it didn't burn. It, didn't, it wasn't consumed. So that got Moses' attention. And he said, Moses said, And I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burned. Now I want you to think about something. And ask yourself this on a personal level. Had there been times in your life when God did things to get your attention? Give me some examples. What are some things that maybe God did in your life? And you look back and you say, whoa, that was God. Okay. What else? What? Could be sickness. What else? I, I'll, give you a good, I'll give you an example. I was in a car accident where the car was completely decimated and I didn't get a scratch. Yeah. And, and, and it was funny because when they, when they went to pull me out of the car, they, they were going to use the jaws of life and I climbed out the window. And the EMTs kept trying to get me to go back in the window. He said, you're hurt. And I said, I ain't hurt. I fell asleep at the wheel. And I didn't have on a seatbelt either. Now, I'm not telling people they should drive without seatbelts, but God held me in that car. And I climbed out the window, the EMTs, and all the EMTs and the police just stood around the car scratching their head. All right? So a lot of times when God, I really believe that when God allows miracles to happen, it's not just for you, it's for everybody that's witnessing the miracle. Because the bottom line is God has to be glorified. God didn't just get my attention that night. He got everybody's attention that night. Yeah. I'll never forget one of them. There was a Maryland State Police, but he looked at me and said, man, you lucky. And one of the EMTs said, lucky had nothing to do with that. Yeah. And I did not have a scratch. So sometimes God, and it was funny too because at that, when that happened, I was on my way to McGuire Air Force Base to be stationed at McGuire. And that's where God was dealing with me about becoming, going into the ministry. And so I believe that God allowed that to happen primarily to help launch my faith. And I think sometimes God does things to launch our faith. You know, a lot of times when we get ready to do the will of God and do the work of God, sometimes we need a little push. Sometimes we need God to do something to maybe uh, stir up our faith or do something to make us realize that this is not you, it's God. All right? All right? Not, 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 not by might nor by power, but yet by, by my spirit, said the Lord. Anything that we do for God, it ain't in our strength, it's in his strength. And this is what God had to get across to Moses from the very beginning. And, and, it's, and it goes, and, and just keep reading, you'll see what I mean. So verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. This was a calling answer. All right, this wasn't just, you know, a conversation. This was the answer of a call. All right, now let's, let's break this down. He said, when the Lord, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, I want you to think about this. God can have a call in your life, but until you're ready to say yes, ain't nothing happening. Until you're ready to answer the call, until you're ready to, 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 to see what God is getting ready to do, because God doesn't force us to serve him. He'll ask you, he'll present it to you, but it's up to you to answer the call. Let me give you a couple examples. The rich young ruler said he wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus, you know, and in fact, before Jesus even challenged him, he was really basically bragging to Jesus, you know, I've kept him commandments from my youth, you know. And, and, and of course, if, if he didn't, Jesus would have called him out on it. So evidently he was a, you know, a pretty good living guy. But Jesus said, you lack one thing. He said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And he said he went away sad 
See, Jesus found out the area of his life that was more important to him than God. And that's why a lot of times when God calls people, he can't really call you until you're ready to walk away from everything that you, that, that, and that's what he says to the disciples. Unless you can uh, leave father, mother, sister, brother behind, you can't follow me. If you put your hand to the plow and look back, you can't follow me. And so every time you read in the Bible where somebody answers the call of God, they're ready for the call. But, and I, and I always tell people this, because you know, you run into people all the time and tell you, in fact, I'm dealing with somebody right now, a friend of mine, and, you know, oh, I, I want to preach, I want to preach. And I tell them, I said, what I want to hear you say is God called me to preach. You tell me you want to preach, but does God want you to preach? Does God want you to be a minister? I'm going to tell you something. Usually the people that God calls, it's not always, uh, God usually has to do some convincing. Because usually when people are called by God, they, they, they try to tell God how inadequate they are, which is what Moses did. We're going to come to that. And, and that's what Isaiah did it. Jeremiah did it. People that are really called really feel inadequate. Gideon felt inadequate. All right? But that's a good thing. Because if you're called by God and you feel inadequate, what that's telling you is they know that they can't do this in their strength. The people that get in trouble are the ones that think they can do it in their own strength. You can't serve God in your own strength. You have to, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit for us to do anything for God. So let's go back here. Verse 3. We're in Exodus chapter 3, Steph. All right, verse 4 it says, And the Lord saw that he turned aside. The Lord saw. God called him out of the midst of the fire that was in Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Now, there's a lot more to this here am I than just him acknowledging God. He was basically answering the call. Here am I, send me. That's what Isaiah said. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, or Saul of Tarsus, and, 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 and the first thing Saul said after he got knocked on that horse was, you know, Lord, what would you have me to do? It wasn't like, why you knocked me off that horse? It was immediately, what would you have me to do? When you have an encounter with God, there's only one thing God wants to hear. Yes. There's only one, if it ain't yes, it's send me, I'll go. If it ain't yes, it's send me, I'll go. It's, you know, what do you want me to do? All right? So he said, here am I. Verse 5, God said, do not come near. Put your shoes off of your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. Now let's stop right there for a second. I'm going to ask you guys a question. I'm going to hear, you know, I'm not looking for right or wrong, but I just want to hear your opinion on it. What made that ground holy? Because God was there. Yeah. Any other answers on that? Anything else? I mean, some other things you can say, but that, that, that's a good answer. It was sacred. God was there. It was sacred. It was sacred because God was there. What else? He said... Take off the shoes on me for the place where you stand is holy ground. Okay? Besides the fact that it was God, what else made that ground holy? Okay, let me ask you another question. What does the word holy mean? Ah, set apart. Set apart. And it's so important that we understand what that word means because not knowing what that word means gets us in trouble sometimes. Now, we all know as being Pentecostal folks, we use that term very loosely. We'll tell somebody in a minute, I'm holy and sanctified. But then when you ask them what does holy or sanctified means, they go, I'm, I, I dress a certain way, I, I, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't cuss. That's not really what holiness is about. There's, there's elements within that about our character, but what God is really looking for is somebody to set apart for his use. Now, if you are set apart for his use, then you will strive to live a, a, a moral life. That comes with the territory. But what God is looking see, there are a lot of people that will tell you that they're holy and don't do nothing for God. 
They'll tell you that they're holy and you ask them to do something for the Lord and it's like, what? I'll give you an example. Years ago, I was on my way to church. On my way to church, I saw on the side of the road there was an old lady with a flat tire. And that particular Sunday, I was supposed to expedite the service. Well, part of me said, I got to get to church on time. I'm supposed to expedite today. But then the other part of me said, I got to help this old lady change that tire. So that's what I did. Change the old lady's tire. I got to church 30 minutes late. One of the deacons went off on me. You were supposed to be here a certain time. Pastor gave me shady look. I didn't say nothing. I waited until after service, and I said I was late because I was helping an old lady change the tire. The pastor understood. The deacon didn't. What was more important, me being there to say, yes, Lord, to help that old lady change her tire? Exactly. Holiness means that when God needs you at a particular juncture, a particular time, you step up to the plate and do it. And sometimes we have a tendency to confuse religion with duty to God. If your religious traditions counter the duty of God, then something's wrong, all right? Because there's times when God will have you do something that's like, why are you doing it like that? I'm like, I'm sure that when Jesus put mud on people's eyes, they were like, why is, why is the master putting mud on people's eyes? Because the Holy Spirit sometimes will lead you to do stuff that ain't really traditional. He'll lead you to do stuff that, and you got to be willing to obey God. That's what God is looking for in these last and evil days especially. Somebody that's willing to obey him in spite of what the other people think. In spite of what the pastor may think or your denomination may think. If God tells you, hey, 4 o'clock, I need you to stand on that street corner, you know, on, on 7th and, and, and Vine or wherever and be there at 3 o'clock. If the Holy Spirit tells you to do that, you better be there because there's a reason. We say we want to be spirit-led. That's, that's a challenge sometimes because being spirit-led means there's times God's going to have you to do stuff that... It, Sometimes God will have, yeah, how many of y'all had God wake you up 3 o'clock in the morning and you can't go back to sleep? That's because God wants you to pray. Don't fight the funk and say, I can't, I can't go to sleep. No, get up and pray. That's why God woke you up. Okay, so he says, do not come near, put off the shoes on your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. Also, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. Why do you think Moses was afraid to look at God? Now notice that he, he really wasn't looking at God's face, but he was in the presence of God. But why was Moses afraid? Why would anybody be afraid to look at God? Huh? Because of the glow? What else? Yeah, inadequate. Inadequate. Exactly. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'm going to tell you something. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit is his greatest work. If you feel convicted when you sin, that's good. When you don't feel convicted, that's scary. I don't mean to be the dead horse, again, but I have to use this one of the best examples I can think of. was just recently, somebody about six months ago asked Donald Trump if he ever asked God for forgiveness. And he said, No. He said, I, I try to do, 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 do everything right, so I don't have to ask for forgiveness. That was his reply. And, 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 and you know, and people like, you know, and, and, but that's humanity. That's how, you know, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When God calls you, he calls you with all your mess. He calls you with your hang-ups, your habits, your hurts, your, your, yeah. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, yeah. God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. That's why God calls some of us. It ain't because we're wise, it's because we're foolish, but God will use us in spite of our foolishness. He uses us in spite of our weakness. He uses us in spite of our flaws. Everybody in the Bible that God used had flaws. The only flawless person in the Bible was Jesus. And there's probably one person that was close to flawless, and that was Joseph. He's probably the closest you're going to get, especially in the Old Testament, to where he was just abused, misused. Job was another good example. But they were examples of how Christ was going to be. 
But most of the people that God used, they had horrible habits, horrible conduct. Samson was a drunk and a whoremonger. You know, uh, Abraham was, was, was a liar. We don't like to talk about that, but he was. Yeah. Noah was a drunk. Yeah, and they all had problems. Jacob was a liar, a trickster. Yet God used them. God called them. So, here's, he's calling Moses. He said, I'm the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hit his face. Why do you think God went down the list of the different patriarchs and said it like that? He could have just said, I'm God. But he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Why do you think God referred to himself like that? That's one thing. What else? How many people here got saved grandparents or saved parents? Okay, we have, right. What, what, what do you remember about your saved parents or grandparents if they're still alive or they're not? patriarchs and our matriarchs because they were an example for us. Alright? So when God's talking to Moses, he's bringing a point of reference. I'm not just, I was there, I was their God, but now Moses is your turn up at the plate. I was the God of Abraham, I was the God of Isaac, I'm Jacob, your father, now I'm your God. Alright? So he, he's bringing this whole thing down and, and now it's, it's a Moses hit his face right looking God. Verse 7, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Notice he says, my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters and oppressors. For I know their sorrows and sufferings and trials. Don't think for one minute that God never sees the suffering of people. Now I'm going to share this with you. I'm ashamed to share it. Not ashamed, but I'm going to share with you something that's really been bugging me. And it's, 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 it's been a challenge to my faith. You know, Every time I look at the news and I see a black man get shot and, and the police officer get away with it, 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 it takes a blow to me. This last guy got shot in the back. Didn't have no gun, no weapon. And he just, yeah, yeah, and, he, and, he, and he got to set Scott free. And, and this is not, this, I read an article today and said, since the election, there have been 600 reported racial incidents nationwide. You know, people getting beat up. There was a guy in the New York Giants football team just yesterday. They sprayed swastikas on his house and wrote Trump on it. If y'all ain't paying attention, y'all need to. And be praying. Because I'm going to tell you something. If I'm not praying, then I'm thinking bad thoughts. If I'm not praying, I'm like, God, where are you at? And if you read, I'm going to get back to this, but you read Habakkuk. Habakkuk had the same problem. He's like, God, why are, my, why are the righteous suffering? You know what God told Habakkuk? You know, Stephanie? What did he tell him? My grace is sufficient. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And that's all we got, saints. That's all we got, but that's all we need. And so here we see... Moses, he's telling Moses right off the bat, I seen the cry of my people. He didn't say your people. He said my people. Yeah, my people. When Paul got knocked off that horse, he said to Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? He didn't say why do you persecute my people? Or, or, or he said me, he made it personal. And I'm going to say this to encourage you guys' hearts. Don't think for one minute that anybody can do anything to a child of God and get away with it. They can't, because we're his children. And even if, even if the, the justice isn't exactly the way we think it should be, God will make sure that everything, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard. Yeah, God's got our back. 
And it, it does get discouraging sometimes. I get to a place where every time I watch the news, I'm like, oh, another, another brother got killed or this woman got killed in jail, you know. And, and, and you just say, Lord, how the mother of the guy that got shot, a lot of people don't understand her reply, but they basically, she, she's a woman of faith. She's saved. And she just says, basically, she, she, justice will be served eventually. God, God will rectify all of this. And some people made fun of her. You know, some of the uh, black commentators are like, you know, that, that, that don't, you know, no. I understand where she was coming from. Yeah. See, people think faith is foolishness. Yeah. Even Job, his wife said, why don't you curse God and die? That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to curse God and die. Don't, don't, don't give up. All right, verse 8. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand and power of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a land, to a, to a land good and large, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Verse 9, Now behold, the cry of the Israelites has come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11, And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I'll stop right there for a second. When you, when you first read that, you know, part of you might think, well, Moses is being a little chicken. No. What was Moses before he spent 40 years in the wilderness? Yeah, he was a prince. He was a, he was a Pharaoh's adopted son. Don't you think Moses knew how big Egypt, Egypt's army was? He commanded part of that army. Don't you think he knew how powerful the, the influence of Pharaoh was and, and, and all of their, you know, uh, might? At that time, Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world. And you telling me, an uh, 80-year-old man, and all I got in my hand is a staff, and, I, and I'm, I smell like sheep, and you want me to go back to, into, into Egypt and deliver your, your, my people? So this is where the, we, 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 we find, and I said this earlier, a lot of times when God calls you, the, like you said, inadequacy rises up. <clears throat> Who am I, Lord? And it's ha it happens to all of us. So don't, don't feel, but you know what? God ain't going to let you off the hook. Jeremiah said, God, I'm too young. God said to Jeremiah, don't say you're too young. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. What does that mean? It means that the call of God was on your life before you were even born. God knew that missionary Stephen was going to be doing missionary work overseas and winning souls. He knew that before you were even born in Willingboro. It, it, was, it was written in heaven before <laughs> you were born in Willingboro. And that's how it is with God. God knows. All right? So he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Verse 12, God said, I will surely be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, Horeb, or Sinai. Both names apply. Sometimes it's called Mount Sinai. Horeb was the name that was, that was given by the locals, the Midianites. They called it Horeb. The Israelites called it Sinai. So it's not a, it's not a contradiction. People say, oh, there's something wrong there. No, it's not. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, and what am what I am, and I will be what I, I will be. I'm reading the Amplified Version. So what I want to understand is God basically kind of, kind of got in Moses' face a little bit. And God could have said Elohim, he could have said Yahweh, he could have said Jehovah, you know, he could have said El Shaddai, he could have said any number of names. And he said, I am. I am. And there's a lot of ways you can look at that. It can, mean, it can be God saying, I'm anything you need me to be. I'm all that you need. Yeah, I am. And you go back to the New Testament, uh, when the Pharisees challenged Jesus and they said, well, how do you know so much? You know, you're not, you know, uh, oh, you're not older than Abraham. And, and Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. 
See, when Jesus talked like that, that's when God got him crucified. The more Jesus started talking like he was God, that's when they really wanted to kill him. All right, so I am who I am. And what really is neat about this, too, is when God uses this, this, this title here, and we go back to what we read in the beginning, when it says the, the, um, the angel of the Lord from the midst of the bush. Remember I told you what, what that term angel of the Lord is? It's a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. So here's Jesus. Literally, Moses is talking to Jesus. You shall say this to the Israel, I am has sent me to you. God said also to Moses, this shall you say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and by this name I am to be remembered to all generations. All right, now, before we get to the, the part where, uh, okay, yeah, I'll start right there. If you, if you look at this story, you know, a lot of times we pick on Moses, and, and I've done it too. We pick on, like, why is he giving God such a hard time? Why didn't he just snap up and do what God, you know? But I want you to really think about something. If God asks you to do something that's way beyond your expertise or knowledge or wisdom or might, it could be intimidating. Yeah, it could be. And that's why sometimes God, you, God is more patient with us than we realize. You know, you know God could have you know, really went off on Moses, but he didn't. He was patient. God was patient with the 12 disciples. If you look at the 12 disciples when you study the Gospels, those guys were knuckleheads. They just constantly did stupid stuff. They constantly dropped the ball. But Jesus kept training them. You know, he'd teach them, rebuke, rebuke them when he had to, but he didn't fire them. Same thing with us. God's not going to fire us. You know the scripture we hear quoted all the time, and it's probably one of the more misunderstood scriptures, when it says, the uh, gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Some people mistake that scripture to mean that you can live any old kind of way and God will still use you. That's not what that verse means. What that verse means is, whatever God has called you to do, he will not repent of that. And the word repent means to change your mind. God is not going to, God calls you surely to be an evangelist, he's not going to change his mind. Whether you run from it or not, he's not going to change his mind. And so a good example of that is uh, uh, Jonah. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and call, tell the people to repent. He said, I'm not doing it. God said, yes, you are. Yeah. And this is why I always tell people, they like to say, God gives us free will. Free will doesn't apply to saved folks. The Bible says you have been bought with a price. Now, before you got saved, you exercised your free will, and God didn't overthrow that. But I'm going to tell you the cool thing about God. Even before you got saved, when we were exercising our free will, God was working behind the scenes trying to get us saved. That's why certain things happen in our life to orchestrate us to the place where we ended up on our knees crying out to God.